Yes, you're listening to Fresh Air Hawaii, the environmental series of ThinkTech Hawaii. And today we're talking with Dr. Panos Prevaduros about the obstacles to transportation in Hawaii. It affects everything we do from visiting relatives on another island to farmers getting their crops to market. And right on, Bill. In the third world, one of the major problems is farmers getting their crops mm -hmm. to market. And that in a sense, cool. that's where we are, 3,000 yeah. miles from the mainland, Right. water between every county. What's the outlook for transportation between Asia and between the mainland? Um, there are concerns, and there are reasons for us to be concerned. Uh, of course, there is, there, there is several past energy crises we had, and more to come. So we have issues now with uh, oil scarcity and oil pricing. Even if there is no scarcity, there is a lot of competition for oil. And how is that going to translate? Well, very expensive fuel for airlines. And this is one of the areas where substitutes to jet fuel, kerosene and what have you, are really experimental, nothing really in mass quantity. Uh, there are a couple of airplanes that are flying uh, revenue flights with substitute kerosene on one of the four engines. Just in case that one goes out, <laughs> the other three are good enough to take the airplane safely where it's going. We, we had but, testimony you know, it's, last uh, week mm -hmm. that uh, the Marine Corps, Hawaii, mm -hmm. is uh, refining their uh, grease from their kitchens and fueling their jets with it. Um, uh, I, th I think this is a little too far-fetched. <laughs> uh, they, they are fueling their hammers. Oh, okay. Not their, right. <laughs> not their planes. <laughs> not, not their planes. Uh, those planes have very, very temperamental engines. Yeah, right. You really got to get the fuel down to the final spec. And I don't think kitchen oil will cut it for uh, a military jet. But uh, there may be uses for trucks and uh, uh, vessels, boats, yeah. shipping. Yeah. One thing we, we really need to emphasize, in addition to getting our tourists here, is getting our goods. Because 95 to 98 percent, depending on what you account for, of goods imported to Hawaii to sustain our life, from vegetables to oil to building materials to everything other than mail, comes by boat. Now, the little known fact uh, that, that escapes a lot of people is that how thirsty those boats are. Okay. Uh, it is uh, something to the tune that when I started looking into it is that a small barge with the tow is going to take 18,000 gallons of fuel to just go from Seattle to Honolulu. Just sure. one trip, one tug and barge operation in small size, not even the gigantic ones. So the so impact we, of that when, is huge. When our fuel peaked a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, airlines were cutting back on, on traffic and, and seats, and the ships were putting the price of the, the oil on charges, top of our... The surcharges, our, right. Matson would do it mm -hmm. almost. They would have almost a weekly bulletin of the, of the surcharge, the fuel surcharge. They call it now. They retracted most of them. But it will be a continuous problem, and this is why I'm helping in small ways a fairly small outfit out of Maui. They're called Pacific Power Sales. Uh, they have invented something of the shape of the kite, as in recreational kites. The kites that we see sometimes in Kailua Beach with those guys, they're very powerful. If the winds are over 10 to 15 miles an hour, these small kites, 8 square feet, can lift a man like two, three floors high, and you better know what you're doing at that time. But let's not diverge. Now, they're talking about testing 50 square meters to 500 square meters kites and fix them on and fit them on fishing vessels and tug and barge operations. If you want to graduate, so to speak, into container ships, you have to go into 1,000 meters. That's almost 10,000 square feet. 
and that's a little too huge to bite right now. Right. We're not even sure that the technology of materials is there to produce that. But they have tried, and those guys are renting a very large recreational boat, and they have proven with multiple experiments that one small size kite, like the ones you buy for recreational use, can pull that boat at five miles per hour of water speed to Molokai and back for free. for free. And that's, you know, that's a gasoline boat. They turn off the engine, they go out of the harbor, they turn off the engine, they put out the kite, you have to have 15 miles an hour of wind or better, and it can take you to Molokai and back for free. Now this Gotta means... Gotta be downwind though. <clears throat> they can manage it, but the wind has to have at least some... Uh, the, the attitude of the wind has to be at least partially favorable. It right. cannot be backward because yeah. obviously in that case re you retract Can't the take. kite. Yeah. Now, that's the thing we started working on. We do what is called the wind rose. And people who have served in, a, in the military submarines, particularly Navy, they know what a wind rose is. Over a year, you find out where the wind blows, which, di which dimensions, which speed, etc. So that's the kind of thing that you do an analysis and see, okay, between mainland and Hawaii, what is the probability that we actually deploy that thing and for how long a time it would work? And the percentage is over 40%. So 40% of the time, you could realize a savings of 10 to 50%. That's a good bet, given, again, that that boat is going to spend 18,000 gallons. It wouldn't replace the motors, but it would exactly. give them a rest. But it's the only one technology that we know of right now that's right on. You put it out there, you can save 1,000 gallons in one trip. Not 50%, but out of 18,000 dollars, it is significant. Yeah. It is, that's why all, it is All a, we have to have is a, is a small disruption in the Middle East, and we're exactly, in big trouble. Exactly. That's what the Germans are waiting for. Because the Germans, they have an outfit that is called Sky Sales, one word. People can look, at it, uh, look it up on Google for it. And they have actually two major installations. And the U.S. Navy tested one, and they crossed the Atlantic. And the U.S. Navy verified that that boat had roughly 13% savings in that crossing. It's a small freighter. And with the sky sails uh, kite, uh, the savings were real. So, and, and these kites are, are not attached to a mast like a sail. They're, they're flying, flying out like there. You like actually a need a very small retractable mast when you deploy to make sure that that thing doesn't flapper around your boat and get tangled. Yeah. So you need to lift it something 100 feet with a telescopic thing like the antenna in your car. And then once it takes flight, it's good to go. You retract everything and your boat looks like it looked before. And then with uh, various, you know, uh, cables, yeah, it's being managed. Yeah. And the technology yeah. now is shifting into an automated kind of control uh, using lasers and all. We're working with the mechanical engineering department on robotics so you can control it by sensing it essentially at night. During daytime, it's pretty stable and you can control it, but at night you don't know where it is yeah. because you deploy it 700 feet up in the, in the sky and at night it's very, very hard to get a handle on it. So, this could, could have a very significant impact on our inter island uh, That's right. Process. That's why uh, the experiments we try to do is inter island uh, between uh, shipping the containers and uh, the tug and barge operations. Uh, that's that's um, an immediate application, plus our fishing fleet and the Alaska fishing fleet. Quite a few people have written letters to this uh, Maui outfit uh, urging them to produce something small because the Alaska fishing uh, fleet is very large and uh, their profit margins uh, because of competition are tight. So when the energy prices went up, they had problems surviving, and some the, of them the, decided to actually not yeah. go and the look Alaska for fish because fishermen it was, have to face some very wild weather. Is this yeah. practical in, in those uh, kind of conditions? Actually, it can be practical because you can always depower it. You can essentially, to be simplistic about it, you open holes to it, so you know it, pro and that's also a safety mechanism in case you get a, a gust of wind. You don't want that the system to. Uh, to rip off your lines. Yeah. So there is automatic depowering if the winds get to be too aggressive and it would be normal winds or gusty winds. You have yeah. to protect the equipment. Yeah, our, so it's our steady that, trade winds are... Right, it's, yeah. a, it's a good deal, yes. Yeah. But uh, you have to account for those eventualities, yes. Well, obviously when we had the ferry, the farmers could get their mm -hmm. crops to that was Oahu. A good thing. And that, yeah. was, that was important. Mm -hmm. uh, what you see is a 
pros and cons of, of ferries, and is there any future for us? I mean, you know, Alaska is very similar to Hawaii in many ways, but they've got an amazing ferry system. Um, right. And easier for me is to refer back to Greece, where I, I come from. And the Greek islands, I mean, they wouldn't survive uh, without ferries. Actually, we have ferries in the hundreds. And the islands are small. Some of the islands have a population of 5,000 people. And in fact, because they're small, it is not viable to have air service. So mm -hmm. everything is ferry service. And all of them ferry boats with a platform, with a door that drops, and then you get people and goods in and out and vehicles. Very quick operations, very safe, of course, very profitable despite the competition. So it is from somebody who looked from the outside looking in, it is a non-brainer that a heavy, fairly heavily populated island complex of seven islands with good navigable waterways, excellent harbors and all, does not have a ferry system. I mean, it is almost an oxymoron, but this is Hawaii. I mean, the way that we have the perfect environment, and when the perfect technology comes in, we do everything politically to send it back home. And this is a message we gave with, we gave with the super ferry. I think yeah, we, the we administration tried to shortcut the environmental impact statements, and there were problems with uh, uh, people bringing stuff they weren't supposed to bring. Uh, the alien species, the, yeah. the second Koki part, frog, yeah, the like. second part is important. I do not agree with the first part. I really don't because uh, while I've been here, quite a few container ship operations have started going out of business. New came in, like Pasha, just to mention a name. Pasha wasn't serving Hawaii uh, five years ago. Now it's a huge container ship that comes in. It's a completely independent operator. How come we never requested any environmental uh, statements out of them? Now, the only reason that triggered the EIS process for the super ferry is because we had to touch the harbor, the pier. It needed a little easement because, in my opinion, they made a design error. They decided to have a special door that needed actually a lifted ramp. They already have canceled that error in the second boat they were ordering. It wouldn't need that ramp. It would go directly to the dock. That's how all the ships of this genre operate throughout the world because they operate from the Mallorcans to the Greek islands, the Caribbean islands and all. It should they be able to just drop. That messed yeah. Up their, their yeah, I don't know for what reason they decided to make uh, their, their, their door quite high so it needed that ramp. Once you touch public property, transportation property with implications, then that thing triggered an EIS. To me, it is really reading the law way too narrowly. It had nothing to do with the intent on the law of the law and the intent of the service. However, I will fully admit that, you know, we needed an investigation about invasive species. That's a different, that's a different idea. Well, we fly to Guam and people keep saying, as I said, I've been here for 20 years, that occasionally uh, you get brown snakes in the containers. So same thing, I mean, we have the process, and if we import containers and other goods, we have to be careful, inform the people, have random or mandatory inspections of any, everything that changes that's, hands that's between really the islands. That's really important, yeah, yes. if, we, if we can check our cargoes. Uh, right, yeah. right, but, and but and now... And snakes yeah. on, our, on our runways occasionally. Right, yeah. right, but uh, for example, now here as I sit on Oahu, I, I consider, you know, some of the species on Maui noxious to Ahu, I think it's a little stretch of reality and trying to really find a problem instead of really addressing what is bigger problems. The faster our transportation, mm -hmm. the more mixing of species from other places we get. And that's yeah, what our yeah, alien yeah, species absolutely. problem is. And unfortunately, the worst kind of uh, species is really viruses and bacteria. Exactly. Particularly through air travel that actually with, uh, for us getting something in the order of seven to eight million visitors a year, that makes us uh, quite sensitive, uh, right. yeah. Yeah, the Department of Health jumped all over that dengue fever when it got yeah. here a little while back. Yeah, and, yeah, that's and right. They and they did an amazing job of stopping it. Right, infestations in Hana and all, and thank yeah. God, yeah, we stopped yeah. it. Yeah. We've talked about between the islands and the problems of getting crops here and mm -hmm. people getting back and forth to visit and all that kind of thing. Um, our, I drove from Hana to Kahului mm -hmm. faster than I drove from Kahului to Lahaina. 
Yeah, there are bottlenecks there. there Absolutely are. right. It's, Absolutely it's right. It's a tremendous problem. Yeah. And uh, the people on the North Shore and Windward Side want to keep country country. Mm -hmm. And we've got proposals to build big communities in mm -hmm. Laia and yeah. uh, Turtle BYU Bay. BYU expansion, yes, and Turtle. And what's going to follow? Four lane highways? Um, well, Somehow, the, we have a mentality that uh, more lanes is a bad thing, which I find it um, out of place. I mean, I, I just look at the plans of the city for second city of Kapolei. More bedrooms, more water lines, more sewer lines, more power lines, more parks, more schools, no more lanes. It doesn't compute. It is an intrinsic part of the infrastructure. Either you do it right or you don't. And not to start changing the conversation about rail, but lanes is a standard part of the infrastructure. You just don't put the plan there, you move 150,000 people over there, and then you come back 20 years later where you realize how severe the problem is and say, oh, you know what? I'm going to invest some billion dollars and provide people an alternative. What are you talking about? You have to have an a fair system that provides basic good transportation of people and goods and a good emergency corridor in emergency response. In other words, you have enough lanes for ambulances and everybody else to respond. And then maybe, if you can afford, provide some alternatives. Water transportation, ferries, a light rail system, what have you. I mean, the, the insanity of Hawaii is beyond belief. Of course, overall, the nation has a lag in catching up with transportation demand versus the roads we build. But Hawaii is an outlier. I mean, really, we stubbornly sit there and they say, no, we're not going to add lanes. But then why are you adding people in homes? Why do we have such a corrupt system? It's really a corrupt system that issues thousands of permits for expansions, land use conversions, and residential construction but no more lanes. No more Essentially, lanes. it creates a safety hazard and a degraded quality of life for these people from the get-go. And part of it is actually reflected in the pricing. I mean, you go out there to get a cheap house and you pay the difference in transportation. The mass transit mm -hmm. can get people from one place to another. Right. And if you're an office worker working in one place, that may work for you. But so many people need to get to a place where they report to work and then go out to build a house or make a sale. Or, and they have to have mobile transportation when they get to work. This is the lifestyle post-1980s or 1990s or whatever. Let's call it the modern lifestyle. Diverse destinations, diverse purposes throughout our daily life. So yeah. your life is not between, bottom line, your life is not between station 3 and station 11. It, the, it's a super minority that will find that, uh, that thing satisfactory, and that is really evidenced in the census statistics. The latest census we have is 2,000. I've the proportion of rail there is 2.09%. 2.09%. I mean, these are cities that already have the rail, mm. okay? So here we have... Ample so evidence very small of what, of what the percentage who are is using. traveling are using yeah. rail. There is no argument about it. Yeah. And you know that 2.09% 2, 2 is nationwide, but 66% of all the trips happen in New York City. If you take New York City out of the equation, the rest of the rail, rail systems do a very small part of helping the nation, you know, with its transportation needs. Well, there's a couple things. Um, the availability of a vehicle, mm -hmm. electric vehicle mm -hmm. perhaps, that could allow people to get to a location and then move around as they needed to. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard of a, of a rental kind of put your right. credit card in the... Yeah, it's called car share. And actually I have one of my PhD students is looking at it as a multiple options of future car use. Uh, there is an extensive uh, system in Singapore supported by Honda. It's called car share, and then you have neighborhoods. Neighborhoods. Switzerland is also very popular. Uh, Seattle, they have two or three cars, most of them hybrids, 
you put them in the middle of the neighborhood, like, you know, an enclave in Macaquilo, and then five, six, ten neighbors, they make appointments for this car, they take it, go to their doctor, go through their groceries and all. Bottom line, there is a shared use, and there is no car ownership. It's not a rental, really, but the neighborhood has it. And then every two or three years, because the, that car clocks a lot of miles, they'll change it. It is a very flexible system of auto ownership. And in Switzerland, which is an affluent nation, and they pretty much have the same number of cars per family that we do, in the neighborhoods that they have it, it drops auto ownership by one, which mm -hmm. means you keep your standard car so the family can depend on automobile number one, but you never buy an automobile number two. When you need to have extra trips, well, you pay X bucks or X euros, and you get that car that Tuesday that you needed, the rest of the time you don't need it. Maybe again, you need the car to reserve it on Friday, etc., etc. Very flexible and much lower impact. You, you see a future for electric cars in Hawaii? A hundred percent. That's exactly what uh, I believe is going to happen. Our transportation is going to come, uh, it's going to be quieter, more benign, and smaller. I think the pendulum is swinging the opposite way now. From We went from the white elephants of the 60s and 70s to the very small Honda Civics of the three cylinders, back to the huge SUVs with seven rows and, you know, 5,000 pound cars. Then again, it's swinging towards the middle for lighter, smaller cars with more uh, electric or hybrid technology. My Prius can take almost any car on a hill. Yeah, I, I believe it. It's a full functional car. I'm very, very curious. I want to be one of the first hundred people that drive the Leaf, the Nissan Leaf, not to make a plug for Hawaii, but, you know, I'm proud that, you know, Nissan decided to be, Honolulu, to be one of the first cities, if not the first in the U.S., that will get the Nissan Leaf, which is a car that is priced, I believe, around $24,000, so there, it's, There's it's a good. lot of um, talk on the mainland mm -hmm. about um, selling freeways to private companies that mm -hmm. would charge a toll. What might be the place of privatization in Hawaii? Uh, the best the best bet we have in Hawaii is not to sell any of our facilities, although they would make a lot of money because they have the monopoly. I mean, if we're crazy enough to sell the H1 freeway from Kahala to the airport, only that segment. I mean, people will offer you good money and then they will charge a reasonable toll, probably one or two bucks, and they'll still make a lot of money. So... That scheme could work, but it takes way too far, you know, initiative and, and complications to get it done. Too, often, would, too what, often our privatization ends up costing us money. It could, it could. A good way that it would work is to follow the Tampa model of using county and private money to create what they did there, 10 miles of the reversible expressway. They realize that they have a peak hour problem, right? In the morning, there's too many come into town, and in the afternoon, too many out of town. So we don't need a full-fledged, you know, six-lane highway. We need three lanes, in town, out of town in the afternoon. So that's what they did. They call it six lanes in six feet. It's basically three lanes reversible and six-foot foundation, 10 miles, $320 million from design, planning, and opening. We are spending more money just to design the rail. And they had a full project, most of it elevated, for $320 million. It opened in 2007. It's not where was, all where was this? Tampa, Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. It's a complete tollway, and it's a county project. The Tampa Hillsborough Expressway Authority is a subdivision of the Tampa Hillsborough County. And they build it with their own money, plus private money, that the toll, which is now only $1.50, it's not really, for 10 miles, it's not really an outrageous toll, right? And it's beautiful. They don't allow trucks on it because the trucks destroy the pavement and they may create collisions. Only cars, van pools, buses, and 60 miles an hour. It's beautiful. It's wow. beautiful. It's a very successful project, public-private partnership at an affordable cost. So do I get the impression that you think that there are a lot of alternatives we should consider rather than mass Absolutely. rail? Uh, the, definitely the thing, the rail we have on the table, it needs to go off the table. Even for light rail, there are better ideas and many members of the community identify them. Not only the Bishop Estate partial elevated light rail, 
but a true light rail following the old Oahu Railway. Nanakuli to the airport, the right of way is preserved and in public hands. It's 40 feet wide. Actually, you can put double the trains. The wow. train needs only 20 to 25 feet. That's 40 feet wide. It's almost light rail instant, if I could call it that way. You pay a billion dollars and you have over 20 miles of light rail guaranteed. I don't know much about mass transit and the elevated railroads and all of that, but it looks to me like we're dealing with technology that's at least 30 years old and what's been proposed. Unfortunately, we set up the rules in such a way that we are stuck with steel wheels on steel rail. That's noisy, heavy. It's very reliable, of course, it's very old technology, but it's not the best. And it doesn't make our city look modern, state of the art or anything. We're coming down to the end of our time. Sure. Um, summarize a little bit. We talked about international, we talked about inter-island and our local situation. Um, the one solution to reducing fuel costs on our water is your kite. Well, since we started, essentially the, 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 the thrust of our uh, talk is opportunities to overcome energy and other obstacles. And I think with technology, technology will be extremely challenging, but also there is a great opportunity for substantial innovation. Uh, for devices and technologies that will help us maintain. We have to maintain transportation. Hawaii is in the middle of nowhere, but maintain affordability for it for the long-term future. That, that, that's the key, because if we can't maintain affordability on transportation, we won't be able to live here. That's correct. Hey, right, folks, we've been talking about transportation. Thank you for your time. Hope you enjoyed it.